Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and our co-sponsor, Harvard's Edmund J. Saffer Center for Ethics, I'm so excited to welcome you to today's event with Diva R. Woodley, discussing her latest book, Reckoning, Black Lives Matter and the Democratic Necessity of Social Movements. Today's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's Ethics in Your World series, presented with Harvard Ethics, featuring leading thinkers taking on tough problems that matter to us all. As we remain digital for the time being, we're so excited to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our ever-expanding community during these difficult times. For today's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. <clears throat> if you go to the chat section, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your own copy of Reckoning. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to this series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you are able to extend to us at this time. Please note that closed captioning is available for this broadcast. Depending on which version of Zoom you are using, you may need to enable it yourself by simply locating the button marked Live Transcript on your display and clicking through all the options. And one final note, as you have no doubt experienced during virtual gatherings this last year, technical issues might come up. If any glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and your understanding. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Diva R. Woodley is an Associate Professor of Politics at the New School. Her work, for which she has received fellowships from the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton and the Saffer Center here at Harvard, approaches the ways that public understanding defines not only the problems we feel we are facing, but also the choices we can make in the face of them. She's the author of The Politics of Common Sense, How Social Movements Use Public Discourse to Change Politics and Women Acceptance, and her essays and scholarship have been published widely in the New York Times, Public Seminar, Contemporary Political Theory, and elsewhere. Today, Professor Wildley joins us for a discussion of her latest book, Reckoning, Black Lives Matter and the Democratic Necessity of Social Movements, a sweeping on the ground account of the formation and significance of the movement for Black Lives which Jack Turner, co-editor of African American Political Thought, calls method methodologically innovative, lyrically written, and politically wise. Identifying among the movement's many intersecting ideologies, a foundational principle she deems radical Black feminist pragmatism, Professor Woodley provides both a unique portrait of the movement and a powerful explanation of the work social movements do in not, in not only expanding democracy, but keeping it alive. We are so thrilled to be hosting this event today. Without further ado, Diva, the digital podium is all yours. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to share my work with you and the Harvard community. Um, so I just wanna go ahead and sort of um, give a brief overview of the ground that the book covers, but then zoom in on the concept of radical black feminist pragmatism and one of its key tenets, the politics of care. Um, so let me start out by kind of telling you uh, the story of this book or how I came to this book. I was actually working on a different second project um, that was based around um, mapping um, economic discourse and particularly the concept of thriving in American discourse. Um, and during the time that I was doing research and building a data set uh, for that work, um, there was the proliferation of videos of police and vigilantes murdering Black people that began to cir circulate online. Um, and uh, the movement uh, for Black Lives, what later coalesced into the movement for Black Lives, also began to arise during that time. And as a scholar of social movements, I understood that um, it was really important for me to um, try to understand this movement because the coverage that I was seeing of it didn't seem to be getting at what I thought or what I observed to be the uniqueness and significance of um, both the way that it was organized and the political philosophy that seemed to be underlying it. And my suspicions about its complexity and usefulness for political philosophy were confirmed as I began to uh, do a series of interviews with organizers and activists in the movement uh, from several different organizations and at many different levels of leadership and movement. So it is about this political philosophy that I wanna share with you today. Um, and I welcome your questions uh, at the end of my talk. 
um, because this is a political philosophy that I think that I'm arguing is the first um, unique, right? The new uh, political philosophy of the 21st century. Okay, all right. <clears throat> The movement for Black lives is often misperceived as merely a reaction against police brutality. On the contrary, this movement is based on a rich and dynamic political philosophy that is unique and that it is distinct from 20th century ideologies and perhaps more profoundly because it embraces an inductive approach to theory building. The immediate subject of this philosophy, which I call radical Black feminist pragmatism, provides a lens through which one can view all of the forces that inhibit Black people's ability to live and thrive. However, I also wanna show the deep contribution that radical Black feminist pragmatism makes to political thought in general, gifting us with the first political philosophy born and bred in the 21st century. This philosophy should be thought of as akin to Imani Perry's notion of liberation feminism, a set of practices for understanding and working against domination and oppression rather than a doctrine. This is because from the perspective of the movement, doctrinal dictates cannot rise to the task of undoing oppression, a state that Prentice Hempel, a leading practitioner of somatics and healing justice in the movement defines as quote, the requirement that you hold another center at the cost of your own, end quote. This focus on addressing politics from lived experience, simultaneous with the belief in a duty to imagine transformative solutions to the systemic plagues that make Black life precarious is the key to radical Black feminist pragmatism. That the political philosophy is new does not mean that it has been invented out of whole cloth. RBFP, which is just the acronym, uh, contains within it elements of political thought that have come before, but have been reconstituted and supplemented to create a natal expression of political thought. In other words, I argue that the political philosophy of the movement cannot be collapsed into what Michael Dawson has called the Black visions of the 20th century, and that it instead offers us something new. Each word that identifies the political philosophy of the movement is important in its explanation. Radical is a mode of questioning. Black feminism is an ethical system and pragmatism is a mode of judgment that guides action. Substantively, RBFP has nine elements. Now I'm just gonna um, share my screen here so that you can keep track uh, of what these elements are because there's a lot of, a lot of moving pieces. Um, The constitutive elements, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so it has nine elements, four constitutive and five substantive elements. And you can see them um, here on this, this graph. The constitutive elements of the theory are those ideas that function as the framework or scaffolding for the substantive principles and are recognizably in the tradition of American pragmatism. These include a belief in the Dewey and concept of social intelligence, a fundamental investment in pragmatic imagination, a commitment to democratic experimentation, and an aim toward liberatory ends. The substantive elements of the theory, those ideas that give the philosophy content and meaning, combine new thinking with ideas that have surfaced in a variety of traditions, most significantly Black feminism. They include the political claim that Black lives matter, the radical mandate, an intersectional lens, a margin to center ethic, and a politics of care. And that last, the politics of care, is one that I will talk about more specifically later in the talk. The substantive elements are ideas about the meaning and ends of politics, and the constitutive elements relate those ideas to a theory of political process. Radical Black feminist pragmatism is specific and experience-based, it calls out anti-Blackness directly and forcefully because without that direct address, our political tendency is to look away toward abstract universalisms. However, the fact that this philosophy is built from the specific lived experience of Black peoples should not obscure what the vision has to offer everybody. The idea that we deserve to thrive because life is valuable and the only way to build a society, polity, and world where this is possible is to devise ways to change the lived experience 
of the most marginalized in the directions of what we all deserve. So now let me drill in or drill down on this notion of a politics of care, which is the fifth substantive element of radical black feminist pragmatism. Politics consists of the activities associated with building and achieving power for the purposes of governing. These activities include developing the understanding, working out the preferences, arbitrating conflicts, galvanizing participation, guiding collective action, and making decisions as a group constituency or polity. In the dominant liberal conception, politics is the domain in which we manage competition over naturally divergent interests. And in both political theory and colloquial usage, politics derives its legitimacy insofar as we deem it to have legitimacy from the rational and strategic rather than, the emotion, rather than from emotion and need. How then can we conceptualize a politics of care? Well, what if we conceived the currency of political aspiration, not as interest, whether real and material or constructed from some indistinct yet somehow naturally decisive miasma of desire and cost benefit, but instead in terms of dignity and flourishing. Such a change is one of orientation toward the motivation and ends of politics, not in the nature of the political enterprise. In other words, a politics of care does not take its mission to be making the process of gaining political power for governing nicer, the competition to direct the attention and resources of the polity will always remain fierce and movement actors do not balk at hard fights. However, the politics of care sees interest disconnected from concern for the dignity and flourishing of the individual in context as ethically unmoored and fundamentally illegitimate, unworthy of collective engagement and action. The politics of care is so central to the political philosophy of the movement and such a contribu contribution to American political thought that I spend an entire chapter in my book examining its components. However, in the context of the broader political philosophy of RBFP, it is important to know that the politics of care has six major characteristics. The, the acknowledgement of oppression as traumatic, the centrality of interdependence, the embrace of unapologetic blackness, a focus on accountability, a defense of Black joy, and a commitment to restoration and repair. In Black feminist thought, this understanding of care is often discussed through the metaphor of mothering. Alexis Pauline Gums, who is a, um, a philosopher um, and also a kind of like uh, a, a activist and organizer in movement, notes that Audre Lorde and June Jordan, among other Black feminists, write about the practices of mothering outside the confines of biological ties or sex roles as specifically political because this kind of radical mothering foregrounds the ways that we are obliged to care for ourselves and each other as whole human beings, especially when we are subject to oppressions that denote our embodiment as always already somehow threatening or criminal. From this point of view, the first premise of political engagement is that trauma and healing must be considered not only personal, but also political issues. Because the ways that those facts shape our experience of the world and our motivation and ability to organize and become mobilized are considered indispensable information for any political project, especially those that consider justice to be their aim. This is because a politics of care is predicated on an acknowledgement that oppression is not only unjust, it is also traumatizing. Therefore, those who seek to organize and mobilize oppressed peoples in an effort to unwind and upend oppressive systems must incorporate a concern with and a practice of healing in their work. This healing, which is often called healing justice, a concept that's taken from the disability justice movement, is seen as not only a psychological, but also a social and political salve and even more profoundly, it is believed that the individual has the best chance to heal by participating in the social and political work of ending oppression. Healing is thus a multidimensional enterprise. It is necessary not only for the individual, but also for society. And that means the approach to attaining healing must be from the individual as they exist in and change the socio-political. 
right? So this is a view of healing that is a sociopolitical um, and economic, right? Understanding of healing that says that we are not gonna mindfulness ourselves out of um, the traumas of the political economy and political arrangement of contemporary society. Instead, it actually requires the political participation, the political acts, right? Um, that we seek to do um, individually and together in order to undo those systems of oppression that cause our traumas in the first place, many of our traumas in the first place. This is where the concept of healing justice derives its meaning. There is an ecosystem of people and organizations that help folks in movement understand what healing justice as applied to the movement for Black Lives means, including the abolitionist and scholar Miriam Kaba, artist activists like Gina Breedlove, Spirit McIntyre, curator and organizer Kara Page, somatic practitioner Prentice Hempel, organizer Emmanuel Brown, and organizations like Harriet's Apothecary and Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity, among many others. Second, the politics of care is based upon an understanding that our cells are always situated, which means that to account for oneself is also to account for one's social condition, location, and connectedness. This means that radical Black feminist pragmatism, that in radical Black feminist pragmatism, the individual is not the basic unit of analysis, nor is an imaginary unitary collective. Instead, attention is focused on the individual in context. Structural conditions and interpersonal independence are thus taken as always relevant to public problems and their solutions. The third element in uh, the politics of care is a focus on accountability. This focus is a deeply pragmatic and democratic orientation. Accountability is not only about taking responsibility for one's actions, but also critically about acknowledging that since one's self is always situated in context, the action that one takes may have unintended consequences. To be accountable is to develop a practice of checking in with those one is working with or for in order to understand the effects of, of uh, discussions as they evolve, decisions as they are taken, and impacts as they are felt. You can see here that accountability is deeply de democratic in its conception, and particularly philosophically pragmatic as well. The fourth element, unapologetic Blackness, is the practical manifestation of a rejection of respectability politics. It is the commitment to acknowledging the whole selves, good and bad, productive and reactive, of people in movement. While unapologetic Blackness is specific to Black people because it is a rejection of the pathologizing uh, black of Black people, it grows from a more general view about embracing the human. Our movements and our conceptions of justice must not be tuned to the exceptional, but to the ordinary not only to the innocent, but also to those who have harmed, not only to those who fulfill normative expectations, but also to those who do not. Unapologetic blackness means that no one deserves to have their needs go in unacknowledged, their concerns swept under the rug, or their personhood thrown away. This may be the most radical aspect of the politics of care, and indeed of the entire philosophy of radical black feminist pragmatism, those involved in movement become radical in the definitional sense. That is, they see themselves as tasked with thinking, speaking, and acting in ways that affect the radix or root of political problems that they understand Black people to face. And this is really important to sort of pause here. The radical and radical Black feminist pragmatism is not about a particular set of um, policy positions. It's not about being out of the edges of whatever the current discourse is. It's not relative in that sense. Instead, it is a mode of inquiry. It is a way of questioning that doesn't assume that the given, right, that the given structure of power and privilege is the one that we have to work within and instead is willing to consider um, that fundamental changes may be in order. That is, um, that to change the root of harms that occur in our society, we may actually have to consider really restructuring certain aspects of our society. Okay, so 
those involved in the movement become radical in the, this definitional sense, right, of going for the root or the radix of the political problems that they understand Black people to face. That set of problem is not only a matter of rights acquisition, economic exploitation, or quasi-legal social exclusion. It is a historical problem to be sure, but one of ontological proportions. It is about the negative way that people, including Black people, have understood Blackness since race became a legible concept um, and the physical, psychic, and social tortures that have been rendered logical and justified on the basis of that belief. Um, and we can see this ongoing functioning of this um, uh, denial of the humanity of Black people uh, going on right now in the sort of most um, covered public trials um, you know, that are happening uh, concerning the, uh, the folks who murdered Ahmaud Aubrey in Georgia uh, and also um, the uh, young man who um, murdered three protesters at a, um, uh, at a march in uh, Wisconsin. The task of movement then is to transform all of our understandings about what Blackness is and means which brings us to the fifth component of this political philosophy, which is defending Black joy. The defense of Black joy is not only about making and holding space for Black people to be carefree free, and express unencumbered happiness, but more profoundly, this defense is also an offense, a cultural project meant to shift the set of dominant associations between Blackness and suffering to a fuller panoply that offers the many ways that Blackness is infused and characterized by a joy that is enhanced by some of the lexicons, traditions, and habits commonly found in the As African diaspora. This is what it means when people in movements say that they love Black people. It means that they are no longer approaching the fight for racial justice or justice of any kind from the position of apology that usually characterizes the posture of the oppressed. This is not a project of acceptance or inclusion into dominant society. It is not about positioning the black community as acceptable or appropriate within white supremacist structures. Radical black feminist pragmatism is about what black people deserve and demand as black people. In this way, the movement is able to flip the perspective of analysis and demands. They can ask as one popular call and response at protests does, quote, I love black people. You don't love black people, what's wrong with you?" End quote. This, this perspective is how the movement has shifted the perspective from asking questions about what justice requires to designing new ways of enacting the answers that they find. As Charlene Carruthers, uh, the former um, director of BYP 100, one of the organizations uh, in the coalitional movement for black lives writes, quote, Following the vision of BYP 100 leader Fresco Stees, we made it cool and relevant to be unapologetically Black. It was not popular to build an all Black activist organization or common for a membership based organization such as ours to be led by young Black women and LGBTQ folks, but we did it anyway. End quote. And here too is the genius of the movement. By embracing that love of Black people as whole unapologetic selves, they made it popular to be involved and invested in disruptive, in a disruptive Black-led political movement. Also, the notion of being unapologetic has proliferated throughout society. And it's not only a question of being unapologetically Black, but also one of being unapologetically human, right? Of understanding that when we think about politics and when we think about justice, we cannot only be thinking about exemplary people, right? People who beat the odds, people who are heroic, right? Um, but instead, we have to design systems for ordinary people. You shouldn't have to be a hero in order to survive. And that's what this notion of being unapologetic really brings home. Finally, the politics of care is concerned with how to think through harm and its consequences from a perspective of restoration and repair, rather than one that centers punishment. The politics of care is an abolitionist politics, which acknowledges that people are not only good or evil, innocent or guilty, but that all people both experience harm and are capable of doing harm. Moreover, this abolitionist perspective asks us to think first 
about the context in which harms are committed, and with that in mind, to craft methods of both redress and prevention of future harm. The scholar and abolitionist Ruth Wilson Gilmore writes, and I quote, abolition is a practical program of change rooted in how people sustain and improve their lives, cobbling together insights and strategies from disparate connected struggles. We know we won't bulldoze prisons and jails tomorrow, but as long as they continue to be advanced as the solution, as the only solution, all of the inequalities displaced to crime and punishment will persist. In this way, end quote, in this way, the concern with restoration and repair is a way both to care for people who have been harmed by seeking ways to repair the hurt caused or restore to them a measure of what was lost and to care for the person who has committed harm by asserting that even as the perpetrator of harms, they are not disposable. And because they will not be thrown away and are still part of the society, they are required to be accountable for their actions by repairing and restoring as much as possible what they have damaged or destroyed. This impetus toward repair is not only operative on an interpersonal level or as a mediation between individuals um, and institutions or the state, it is also an orientation that is meant to be taken up at scale. A politics of care requires us to consider what harms society ought to account for and how we should reckon with the need for reparation. For those who adhere to radical black feminist pragmatism, I'm gonna stop sharing screen now. Hopefully you guys have, have gotten a, um, have gotten those elements down. For those who adhere to radical black feminist pragmatism, care is not only an ethic or a set of moral principles, it is also importantly a politics that is an essential activity of governance based on the acknowledgement of the basic need for and responsibility to provide the care that is always required for human life and therefore must be attended to in the arrangement, management and maintenance of society and politics. This notion of care has a deep affinity with the voluminous literature and feminist political theory. Joan Tronto's notion of a ethic of care, which she introduces in her book, Caring Democracy, contends that, quote, what it means to be a citizen in a democracy is to care for citizens and to care for democracy itself, end quote. However, people in the movement do not center care because of a commitment to the idea of democracy or the duty and value of citizenship but instead in accordance with the fundamental political claim that animates the movement. That is because they matter to themselves and to one another. There is no intermediary term between care and the person to legitimate the necessity of caring. And there is no appeal to abstract categories to bestow significance on the bodies, minds and spirits in need of care. People simply matter and that is the reason that they deserve care. Let us pause to consider this. To matter by its primary physical definition is just to exist as physical substance that has mass at rest. But it also means to be of importance or significance and to have content and subject that is distinct from manner and form. Again, that's the appearance of that notion of being unapologetic, right? You, you matter because of uh, content and some substance that is distinct from manner and form, okay? So it's not about your comportment. A matter is also an affair under consideration. The reason for distress, it can be the pus that seeps from a wound. One does not matter because of the way one behaves or the way one's form is made or appears. One does not earn the properties of substance and significance via motivation or avocation. One is not bequeathed the ability to matter by right. There are explanations for the reasons that we matter, but no justification is necessary. We simply do matter, and so we deserve care. Now let's examine this notion of care. Care here is not a mere sentiment, nor does it indicate a posture of deference or coddling. Instead, care hews closely to the dictionary definition. In its noun form, it means the provision of what is necessary for health, welfare, maintenance, and protection, and also serious attention to doing something correctly in order to avoid unnecessary damage or risk. 
as a verb, to care means to feel concern for or interest in something, to attach importance to it and provide for the needs that one observes. In this way, the politics of care begins with the conviction that it matters when whole populations are hurting from harms inflicted by the ways that we have structured society, whereby some people are systematically advantaged and others are systematically disadvantaged. It matters that we have designed politics so that some voices are much more likely to be heard and have influence than others, though all may bear, bear an equal legal claim to citizenship. It matters that in the United States, we have a grotesquely huge carceral system that consigns some people to not only be confined in cages, but also to what Orlando Patterson has called social death or the denial of full personhood and the mark of disposability. And so to care, means to take seriously not only the material deprivation, but also the pain that accompanies these political realities and to work to mitigate the causes and repair the devastating results. A politics of care begins with the notion that it matters if we're hurting, that we must attend to that in the conception and carrying out of our activities toward governance. Therefore, the politics of care is a reframing of the purpose, priorities, and experience of politics. It is a way of pursuing self community and political governance that values feelings and somatic embodiment, along with what we are enabled to do in the world as it actually exists. This is important. It is not focused on the formal rights that we may bear. It is, it is focused on the things that we are enabled to do in practice in the world as it actually exists. In this way, the politics of care acknowledges those modes of experiencing, knowing, and doing that are most devalued in dominant liberal, masculinist, and capitalist paradigms. It is because of these underlying values that the politics of care acknowledges those elements that we talked about before. Oppression as traumatic, the understanding of interdependence as fundamental, the centrality of accountability, the affirmation of unapologetic blackness, the emphasis on the defense of joy, um, and an abolitionist perspective, which looks to restorative rather than punitive practices to address harm. Okay, so there are a lot of other elements of the book. Um, I don't only discuss the political philosophy of the movement. I also talk about its unique political organization and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q and A. Um, I also make a more basic argument about um, the work that social movements do in democracy. Um, and conceive of social movements as a kind of fifth estate, a democratic institution. There's a reason that social movements have existed as long as democracy has existed. And it's because social movements are the things that help uh, democracy to become repoliticized when institutions that we have arranged um, suffer from the barbarian sort of pitfalls of the iron cage, right? Institutions become self-serving rather than mission-serving over time, including democratic institutions. And elections don't appear to be enough to correct that. So social movements are on the scene in order to repoliticize public life and to remind citizens that they are the first and final arbiters of legitimate authority of governance and to remind them what it means um, to be political actors. Uh, and the power of acting collectively together and demanding um, representation and responsiveness from the institutions um, that they have authorized to govern them. Okay, I'm ready for questions. Great, thank you so much, Professor Woodley. Let's get started. So we have a really good question from Susanna in the audience um, who asks, thank you, Professor Woodley for drawing a political philosophy out of a living movement. Given that the MB, M4BL is in process and unfolding, could you speak to whether it was challenging to pin down the philosophy from within the thick of moving history? Or did you find that the political philosophy was clearly in place from the start of M4BL? Thank you again. Well, I mean, um, I'm so glad that you uh, understand and sort of have picked up on the fact that I did not invent this political philosophy at all, oh, right? Yeah. I did not take credit for it. Um, this is imminent in the movement. And um, I didn't actually start out um, writing this book thinking that I was going to do a deep dive into political philosophy. I really thought that I was going to do an examination of the organizational arrangement, which I found very novel um, and unique. 
Uh, but as I started doing my interviews, um, people started repeating many of the same principles to me over and over, right? People who didn't necessarily know each other, people who were in different organizations that had different focuses. Um, there were these fundamental principles that they seemed to be coming back to. And so um, it became incumbent on me to just, just want to write them down. Um, now, the movement is certainly living and still in process and still you know, uh, going through its uh, sort of ups and downs and ins and outs um, and developing new political strategies every day. But these principles are pretty constant. Um, and you know, people who are involved in movement now, um, because now we're almost 10 years into um, uh, the organization of, of, of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? In its various forms, it wasn't really codified into uh, the movement for the Black Lives until eight years ago. But um, even so, there's a new generation of leadership coming up right now. Um, and they have different focuses than um, people who are founding members of organizations, right? Who have moved on to other parts of, uh, of their life, other parts and other stages of their lives. Uh, but they still hold very closely to these principles, even as they devise different tactics, different strategies, different focuses, right? Um, and that's in part why I wanted to write it down because it's something enduring and it's something not only for the movement, but I think for American political thought. Mm. Thank you so much. So we have two questions that are sort of asking about the internal organization of the movement as well as your involvement with it. So I'll start off with just the sure. first question. So who, uh, attendee just asks, I would love to hear more about the internal organization of the movement mm -hmm. and how it's inspired by or deviates from movement building of the past. Sure. Um, yeah, this was the thing that actually originally made me interested in writing about um, the movement was that it has a really unique structure. So in the literature on social movements, um, often you find a dichotomy between um, what are considered like old or traditional social movements and so-called new social movements. Um, and the distinction uh, between these two different forms of movements is supposed to be that old style kind of 20th century, like um, early to mid 20th century social movements um, would coalesce in large organizations that had hierarchical centralized decision-making structures, charismatic leaders, um, and um, sort of a centrally dictated set of um, tactics, campaigns, and policies. Um, that came with some pluses and some minuses. Those traditionally organ organized uh, movements had a lot of coordinating power, which is um, it, which can be a very good thing. That is that they could coordinate national campaigns over a large geography, um, have centralized messaging and uh, messengers that were recognizable to the public um, in ways that um, uh, can be beneficial to, um, you know, uh, making sure that people understand the uh, principles, um, uh, policies, goals, right, that, um, that, um, uh, the movement is about or going for. But there are also a lot of drawbacks to that structure. Um, that kind of structure means that um, any kinds of um, uh, factions, disagreements on tactics or goals or focus can turn into movement destroying um, arguments. Um, and that uh, it also means that movements are not, while they're able to coordinate on a single kind of point or goal uh, much better, they're actually not able to move in all of the um, domains or issue areas that they might want to or that might be necessary in order to make fundamental change. Um, in addition, that form of organization is dangerous um, in terms of repression from the state or other actors. Because if you have um, very visible um, leaders, right, sing, you know, charismatic leaders, um, then they can be um, decapitated, right? I think that's a, the, the um, language in international relations literature. And that means assassinated, but it also means um, uh, bought off, discredited, um, burnout, right? Like if you have all of this power located in one or two or three places, um, then you risk the entire movement on the, um, you know, uh, the backs, right? As a burden of one or two individuals, right? So there are some drawbacks to that. New social movements, on the other hand, um, people started talking about those, right? Scholars started writing about that 
um, in the 1990s, basically. Um, and these were movements that were seen as um, lifestyle movements. Um, uh, that's what they were called, lifestyle movements or you know, um, uh, I identity movements, right? Um, the identity movements is a little bit of a slur because what it means is not class-based politics. Um, uh, this is a fundamental misacknowledgement of the idea that class, especially in the American case, is also an identity, right? Um, there is no politics that is not identity politics. Um, but anyway, this distinction was made. Um, the thing organizationally about these new social movements was that they were supposed to be um, horizontal, um, non-hierarchical, decentralized, um, and they had a lot of um, cultural power, but much less coordinating power, and were much less likely to have uh, leaders that were sort of recognizable to the general public. That made it harder for them to um, have messages that were, um, you know, easy to get out and that were well understood, right? So there, there was, were drawbacks to those kind of new social movement formations. It was harder for them to mobilize large groups. It was harder to coordinate large groups if they managed to mobilize them. Um, and it was harder to get their message out. So the movement for Black Lives or the Black Lives Matter movement writ large um, is one that has sort of taken the lessons of those two different forms and developed a kind of semi-federated hybrid form. Um, and um, what uh, they do is that they govern via a table structure. And what that is, is that there are, um, you know, uh, dozens of autonomous organizations that affiliate under the banner of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So there's BYP 100 in Chicago, um, Black Lives Matter Global Network in uh, Oakland, Southerners on New Ground, right, in Atlanta, um, you know, um, so, so many different kinds, Harriet's Apothecary, right, in New York, right? Like there's so many different organizations. Um, and they all have their own things that they work on, right? Sister Song, right, is also a Southern organization, right, who works on maternal mortality. So people work on maternal mortality, people work on electoral things, people work on housing, people work on um, healing justice, right? Like so many different things. However, for movement-wide campaigns, they can come together um, in tables, right, which are areas of expertise that the organizations send representatives to. Um, and then those tables take decisions, they make decisions um, that then are carried out by all affiliated organizations, right? So they have a policy table. I mean, and the tables can also shift, they're not always the same. So there's a policy table, you know, electoral justice table, healing justice table, organizing table, right? Um, um, and sort of other kinds of tables that arise as needed. And what happens is that people come together, representatives from all different organizations, they create working groups on problems that they wanna figure out strategies for, talk about them together, and then they make a decision about what the movement's going to do movement wide. So what that does is give them the coordinating power of a large organization, but without the drawbacks of having a centralized hierarchical organization. Um, and this is also the reason why the movement is leader full, right, rather than having one or two charismatic leaders right at its um, helm, um, because it also hews to the kind of Ella Baker style of organizing, which is to say, if we have a long term struggle that we think of as generational, we don't need a single charismatic leader, what we need to do is cultivate leadership in a variety of different places across a dozen, you know, as many different domains as we need in order to move from as many directions as are necessary in order to accomplish our goals. So, um, so yeah, so that's the, that's the kind of like uh, the basic organizational structure of the movement, which is um, pretty unique and dynamic and takes, I think, the strengths of kind of each form uh, of, of organization that are detailed in the social movements literature um, but in a, in a, a different way, right? Uh, it's a kind of, um, you know, and I call it semi-federated because there's no kind of central decision-making body, right? There's no federal government, right? <laughs> right? There's no decision-making body that actually eclipses the table and can sort of veto what they decide, um, but it does have that kind of representative nature, right? Like send your representatives, we'll talk it out, we'll make decisions. So it's like a legislature without a, an executive branch.
And it, I mean, and it sounds like that's where the pragmatism comes in, in terms of approaching it from so many different organizations that are targeting specific issues um, and sort of trying to create a whole structure that encompasses all of life, you know, and, and what it's yeah. needs are. Exactly. And it also creates a lot of different opportunities for coalition building. That's the other thing that I didn't talk about as much um, in this talk, but um, the movement for Black Lives has also been hugely influential on other movements, right, that have arisen during this time. And there are a lot of people, like a lot of actors, right, that are sort of in common, a lot of political actors, I don't mean like you know, but a lot of political actors that are in common among movements and people who talk to each other, they affiliate um, with each other, they have um, coalitional organizations like the Rising Majority, which is a coalition of, um, you know, Black and Latino um, uh, political actors, right, and, you know, so there's a lot of uh, opportunity for touch points, right, for people to move in the way that they want to move um, and to uh, cultivate relationships and participate in a variety of different ways. And that's also, that also aids in culture shifting, right? Because you see an echo of similar kinds of analysis and understanding coming out of environmental justice circles, coming out of feminist circles, coming out of immigrants' rights circles, right? Like, so that's also part of the pressure, right? It's, it's about sort of pushing from every direction that you can. And one individual can't do that. You really need proliferation rather than centralization. But you also do need coordination. And so a democratic form is best for that. It's truly such a brilliant system. Um, so this is the second question about the structure. Um, so an attendee asks, thank you for this talk, Professor Woodley. Your book includes many on the ground interviews with activists, people involved in the ongoing movement. You dive headlong into the foundational principles of M4BL, but was there a sense as you were compiling that you were also participating in a sort of oral history? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was. Um, so, so yes, it was a very weird project for me because this is actually not, I mean, I, um, my first book is also a contemporary history, but um, at the time it was published in 2015 and I was examining 1994 to 2004. So it was like a decade removed from, um, from, from the time that I was writing it. Um, and that's actually the zone in which I'm most comfortable. I like a contemporary history, but I also like for there to be some codification, right? So that there, you know, the, the data is a little bit more static. Um, However, this movement was unfolding, right, while I was writing it. And um, so there had to be an element of oral history and contingency, um, you know, in sort of making my examinations. Uh, but even so, I didn't rush. I mean, this, I, I wrote this book over five years um, and um, just tried to really make sure that I was being as accurate and consistent as I could and that I was being a kind of witness um, and I talk about that also in the preface of, of the book, because the thing is, is that I'm not an organizer. Um, I am an activist, although um, I was much more so earlier in my life than I am now. Um, so I can't claim those kinds of things. I'm in no way an architect or major participant in this movement. Instead, I'm a scholar and I'm a witness. And so my job was to try to codify the things um, that um, folks were doing, right, as they were doing it. And um, it was very challenging, and, um, but it was also really rewarding, right? Because I also understood or came to understand how um, the thing that I was doing was a kind of service um, as well, because organizers and activists often don't write down the things that they learn and the things that they know because they're so busy kind of reacting. Um, so on that side, right, recording that, but also on the side of scholarship, right, because scholars also lose out on the knowledges that people who actually practice politics amass um, precisely because they are often not, sometimes they are, but they are often not the same people who are, um, you know, um, in the thick of sort of creating social change. So I tried to be at that nexus um, to sort of record things for the movement and put it in the context of scholarship so that it could also aid with the building of um, knowledge, um, you know, um, in scholarly environments so that we don't lose the sort of implications, significance, debates, questions um, that are opened up 
by this uh, very significant political phenomenon. Mm. So this next question, I'm <clears throat> I'm interested in the in the cultural proliferation you talked about in your last answer. So this next question, um, I guess, kind of hints at that, but. So this person says, it's hard not to feel cynical about the performance of social justice progressive politics that we saw from countless corporations and organizations last year in response to massive public outcry. How can those allied with M4BL best continue to push for accountability going forward from these corporations? To just push. <laughs> I mean, that's the best yeah. way. I mean, so look, I understand, especially from young people, right now I'm teaching freshmen for the first time in, in, a, in a several years, um, and they are all really concerned with this question of authenticity and performativity. Um, and I understand that on the one hand, but on the other hand, we have to understand that cultural change is something um, that often is uh, performative in the first instance and only becomes um, a part of common sense as time goes on, right? And becomes like enacted in institutions, structures, and policies only if the cultural sense that it is necessary persists over time, right? So this is really critically important. Um, if people stop holding public you know, entities, whether they're corporations or other kinds of entities, right, elected officials, right, um, if people stop pressuring or holding them accountable for the things that they have declared about their commitment to racial justice, right, then they will stop being committed to those things, right, they will stop even the performance of that commitment and certainly won't move forward to actually implementing material changes. That requires public pressure, right, um, and the thing is about being a democratic citizen, that's what's always required, right? People in power um, um, tend to be very inertial, right? This is kind of one of the basic like lessons of political science is that um, folks who are in power are single-minded seekers of re-election, right? People who are running sort of corporate PR boards are interested in those clicks that they get in the moment that they get them, right? It's not um, that the, the idea that people are primarily driven by authentic principledness, right? Um, as sad as this might make us, right? Um, both because they might, might not be actually driven by those principles, but also because the structures of power as they exist are highly constraining, even if you do, right? Even if you are committed to those principles, there has to be an opening created to actually make material changes. And the thing that creates that opening is public pressure, right? Um, so I would say that you, you have to keep calling, right? On people to make material changes in terms of what they have said their commitment to racial justice is, right? And that's all of our job. So much, that's such a great answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I think this will be our last question, um, which sort of just wants to dive into the process of making the book a little bit more. This questioner asks, is there anything from your research that didn't make it into the final book that you wish you could have included? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I feel like everybody, anybody who writes a book will tell you that there's like, you know, pages and pages of, of things and, and, you know, data that they weren't able to include, um, um, you know, and might think about working on as like a separate project, right? Like as a separate kind of, um, you know, set of papers or a, a collection. Um, I would say that for this book, uh, what I couldn't include that I wish I could, I could have included were um, maybe an index of transcripts of the interviews, <laughs> which just would have read hundreds and hundreds of pages by itself. Um, uh, not hundreds and hundreds, but like too many pages to publish extra, just so that you could see the sort of texture and nuance and consistency actually um, across the ways that people in movement were thinking and how it really seemed to, um, you know, how it, it just became irresistible for me to think about it as a very organized, you know, political philosophy and like way of thinking. Um, I also wish I could have delved a lot more deeply into, even though I spent a lot of the book thinking about a politics of care, really thinking through what healing justice is and means and how it connects to the concept of thriving. Um, and particularly in terms of political economy. But I think part of that will make it into my next book, which is about economic discourse. I'm really, really interested in changing the of frame or the potential 
right, to change the frame of how we think about political economy from one that's based on, um, um, you know, uh, profit and um, uh, prosperity only to one that thinks about well-being and thriving and what are the things that um, uh, constitute that, right? It's exciting to hear that something you had thought about going into the book now can lead to future projects. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, great. So that was our last question. Professor Woodley, is there anything you want to say before we sign off for today? <laughs> I don't think so. Just thank you. I <laughs> uh, really appreciate the time and space to share my ideas. And uh, I hope that you are all well. Yeah. Well, thank you again for today. Thank you. Thanks everyone out there for spending part of your afternoon with us. And thanks to the Edmund J. Saffer Center for Ethics for co-sponsoring today. Please learn more about this incredible book and purchase Reckoning at Harvard.com. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your week, keep reading and stay safe, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you.